Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again, Itamar. We are right now, um, just a few hours away, of entering the great, awesome day of Yom Kippur. And today I want to focus on the opening prayer that we all know, it's famous, called Kol Nidre, that we say when we enter the Beit Knesset on the eve, eve of um, Yom Kippur. And it's fascinating, this prayer itself is all about um, releasing our oaths. It's called, we call it Hatarat Nidarim, right? And literally, I'll just translate some of the words, all of our oaths and our prohibitions and our, our swearings and our um, charamot, we take upon ourselves, our possessions that we want to, to um, donate to the temple and, and all kinds of things that we, we took upon ourselves to abstain from. And we actually use the terminology of, it's like we say, this is prohibited to, to us as if it's a sacrifice. All kinds of things that we made prohibited to ourselves. Um, and then we go on to say, from this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur, um, this God willing, which will be coming um, upon us in, in goodness, we all totally have remorse what we did. They are all free. We are all forgiven. We are totally um, nullifying them. They are not going to be at all established. And talking about all different forms of oaths and swearings, etc., as I mentioned. Now, the question, of course, is why, we, why do we open up the Yom Kippur, um, Yom Kippurim holiday, with a special day where there's just so many things to talk about? The temple, what went on in the temple is huge, and we, of course, unfortunately, it's not yet built our third temple, but we lack all, most of the um, <clears throat> great um, service of the day, which took place in the temple, we don't, doesn't take place then, unfortunately. So why don't we open up discussing what was done in the temple, for example, we don't do that. And of course, Yom Kippur itself deals with um, our repentance and returning to Hashem and, and all that, the day of forgiveness and all that. And we don't open up with that either. We're opening up with nullifying our, our vows and our swearings and such that we took upon ourselves. And that's a very interesting question is why? Now, first, I want to quickly mention, where does this prayer come from? Well, this prayer um, is already mentioned during the Gaonic period. The Gaonic, we're talking about the, the six, uh, 600s um, in Iraq, then known as Babylon, Bavel in Iraq. And this prayer, as we see mentioned in the writings of our Gaonim, and there was a discourse, there was a, a disagreement whether this prayer should be um, actually said on Yom Kippur or not, and... Um, the custom was it became part of our prayers, as we see, way goes way back in the Talmud. Talmud talks about nullifying our oaths, so it's obviously something that came beforehand. Um, there are those that goes way back to the time of the Great Assembly, but the custom until it finally became a custom and, and um, an organized custom in all of Israel. You know, it took it took um, time before it developed into a custom. But today, as we all know, it is something that everyone. Everyone um, rushes to the synagogue to be part of this prayer, whether religious or non-religious. The Jews are coming and everyone's hearing about this great prayer and they want to be part of it. So it became something very, very powerful. And, and the question is, we know there's no custom in Israel that's just <clears throat> for naught. The fact that we have something that becomes a very, very deep tradition in our people, it means there's something very, very obviously great behind it. And we have to understand what is this meaning of the Nadogit. Well, first of all, it's important to mention that in um, a famous story in the burning of the Talmud in, in Paris in um, around 1242, there was a terrible um, anti-Semitic attack against um, the Jews in France where they put the Talmud on trial. And why? Because of the prayer of Kol Nidre, this prayer that we say we nullify all our, our oaths and our swearings and all our commitments, right? So it was sort of taken in an anti-Semitic way that, and this was initiated by a, a Jewish renegade, someone who left Judaism, a convert to Christianity, um, who claimed, his name was Nicholas, and he claimed that Israel was, you know, the Jewish people were using this custom in order to not at all want to be obliged to pay back their loans from the Christians, and we're doing that, 
and therefore we have our prayer on the Yom Kippur service. And as a result, they put the, although there were great rabbis and, and argued that it's not the case at all, of course, and and this is um, only this is talking about our obligations between us and God and what we have to do and, and our spiritual um, work. But nevertheless, uh, Nicholas Donin, um, this um, renegade Jew, he pushed forward and convinced the Christian world at that time, the tribunal, to put the, the Talmud on trial, and they burnt, they decided to decree to the burning of a Talmud. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy in history. And, um, but we could say, one of the beautiful things that came out of this was that Rabbi Yechiel, um, <clears throat> one of the great um, Talmudists, he was a Balei Tosafot, Rabbi Yechiel at Paris, and other great rabbis, the Balei Tosafot, they decided after this event to move to Israel. So I can say it's a terrible tragedy, but what came out of it was we have to leave and go back to the land of Israel. It's part of the part of the repent, um, the re, what's it called, the redemption process of returning. Right? It's part of tshuva to repent and to learn. And in exile, unfortunately, we are mo- we are suffering throughout history from these kind of things. <clears throat> By the way, I can mention as a result of this, there was something called um, the the Shavuot Yudin that made, made the Jews swear throughout Europe. Um, Every year, during our Kol Nidre service and other places, they would have this, this ceremony where they would even put out pigs on the floor, on the ground, pig skins, Jews would have to stand on that in Germany, and they would have to swear that they're not going to maintain their vows, and it was really, became a really anti-Semitic, um, you can look it up and, and check in, it's in the history books, very, very painful, um, historical, um, anti-Semitic acts against the Jews came out of this special prayer itself, which is, which is shows, again, every time the, the, we call them the husks of the nations that are coming upon Israel, there's something very deep here um, that's a very powerful prayer, obviously, and they're trying to somehow undermine what we're doing here. Now, what does this all mean? Why are we, why is it so important with all the other things that the Yom Kippur holiday represent to open up the day with this um, prayer of Kol Nidale? And I would like to just read a few words of Rav Kook. Rav Kook has a very, very um, interesting explanation about the general concept of, of um, what we call nidarim, right? Um, what we call oaths. And Rav Kook, again, <clears throat> he writes, and again, I'll try to quote his words. This is, um, just getting the sources brought down in something called the Pinkas of Rav Kook. Pinkas means like his notebooks. And he writes like this. He says, When a person has this awakening of his soul, it's not a constant. You know, a person's always on a level where he has this great feeling of to uplift himself and to have a great spark of, of uh, what's it called? He's igniting his soul to go forward, right? It's not, it doesn't happen all the time. And right? he's saying it's like the sword that turned around in the Garden of Eden. Um, quoting the Rambam from the God to the Perplex, and he says, So he's saying when this happens, it is suitable for us to leave an impression. When we have these bursts of, of, of inner awakening, it's a great thing to leave its impression. And that is what he's saying, what a nether is all about. That's what really the deep meaning of behind an oath, when a person has some kind of burst of spiritual energy, and he wants to go forward and improve something in his life. So that that moment, Rav Kook is saying, grab hold of that moment, and then that's when you do, that's when you take the oath. Because you want, oh, you, know, you want to do something great, you know, that's, that's just, so a person says he wants to be, for example, a Nazarite, right, a Nazir, or a person who takes an oath, that's a very, very, it's a whole, that's a whole thing based on oath, right? A person takes an, um, an oath to be a Nazir, to be a Nazirite. That's a powerful oath. And there's all kinds of restrictions that come upon himself. That's one example we see in the Torah. Of course, when a person takes upon himself an oath to bring a sacrifice, at that moment he wants to do something to uplift himself spiritually. So Rav Kook says it's, it's a burst of, of, of regesh, a burst of emotion. And get on that road because you're not always on that level of that spiritual feeling, and you want to maintain it. You want to, you want to um, keep it strong and keep it going, right? So you take that oath, and and for a long time, 
רק כל זמן תעשה, אמנם אם התרוממות יוכל לפעמים להיות נלווה איזה יסוד זר דמיוני. On the other hand, Rav Kook says, what is, the, what is the, the challenge a person can have together with that upliftment you want to take upon yourself? You have all kinds of dimyoinos, we call them. The power of the imagination runs away from you. V'chayim atzma mevaririm achakach et erech asig shebo. And life itself will eventually clarify where is the blemish in your spiritual drive. What is pure and what is not pure. Therefore, there must be an ability to release the vow at certain times through a, a wise rabbi that is able to um, eliminate or report before a court. Right? Because sometimes we know that this is not imaginary, it's not something that's based on um, just an imaginary thing you, um, you're imagining about yourself, but you really, it's really true and you really can go forward. But you don't have the power to do this, your situation, because of, of, of your life situation. A person can't do this for a long enough time. And therefore, there are two kinds of ways of, of releasing of this vow. One by finding an opening, and one by total remorse. I'm not going to go into the details of how, you know, what all these things mean, because there's a lot of laws regarding oaths. But the point, the amazing point of Cook is a beautiful explanation is how a person gets on that wave and he has this energy, this emotion, and he wants to do something with it positive, so he takes, takes an oath. But there are dangers involved. His imagination is running away with him. Was he careful enough before he made his decision? As we all know, if we take a, a terrible example, and it's a great example, but a terrible story, mentioned in, in um, the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges, as we all know, I didn't want, every time I think about the story, it's, it's painful, and you just want to literally cry over the story of Yiftach, as we all know, Yiftach HaGiladi, um, he was a, sh- a judge, he was a great, he was a great powerful man, and a son of a harlot, and as we all know, um, Yiftach HaGiladi, they, at that time Israel, he was pushed out because he was the son again, he wasn't exactly the best, um, we call in Hebrew Yichus, he didn't come from the best line of, uh, of um, the chain of of people that are considered the elite. He wasn't exactly in that level. But whatever it was, Yiftach HaGiladi, he was a um, great gibor, and he had his son named Vayoled Gilad at Yiftach. His father's name was Gilad, and he gave birth to a person named Yiftach. Whatever it was, I'm reading some of the verses, and it says, Vayivrach Yiftach Bnei Yachav, Basically, his brothers didn't really, they would chase him out, he had to run away, they weren't too good to him, because again, as I said, his line wasn't exactly um, a good yuchus, a good um, family background. You know, his father was, was um, Gilad, but um, on the other hand, his mother came from a bad place. Anyway, so it goes on to talk about in the book of Judges, that Israel got into trouble with the Ammon, with Ammonites, with the Ammon, the Ammonites in English. And, um, I don't know how to say that, I hope I said it right, Ammon. <laughs> and they turned, after throwing out Yiftach out of the, um, out of the house, basically had to run away, they come back and they ask him, I want you to be an officer over. So he goes, what do you want me to be an officer over you? Because <laughs> yesterday you were, um, you threw me out, whatever it was, no, we need you, you're a tough guy. He agrees, and our rabbis say he was he wasn't a learned rabbi. He wasn't a learned leader. He was an amaretz, a simple person. He didn't know. And here we, we have the terrible story of how he falls down with a terrible oath. We look in um, the book of Judges, chapter eleven, verse number thirty. Vaidal iftach neder l'ashem. He makes a um, a oath to God, and he says, "If God is going to give the Ammon, right, the Ammonites in my hand," he says. The first thing that's going to come out of my of my home, that's going to greet me when I come back from peace from the war of Ammon, <clears throat> he's going to offer as an offering. And we see this terrible tragedy. Um, his daughter eventually comes out and and um, out of the home when he comes back, and it's a terrible tragedy. And there's a, there's a midrash which I'm not going to go into lengthy details, but it's, it's so painful to discuss what went on and what happened there, and he could have actually um, nullified the oath by going to Pinchas, Phineas, who was a great rabbi at that time, and a Kohen, a priest. He could have gone to him, he could have nullified. 
but he didn't do so because each one was, was holding on to their, their hat. Pinchas said, you know, who is he to come, you know, why am I to step down, step down to his level to go to him? And Yiftach was saying, why should I go, why should I go to him myself? Because I'm, I'm a judge now, right? And at the end, this poor girl ends up um, falling between the, that situation and the terrible tragedy and losing her life. You know, according to certain opinions, she's uh, different opinions about what happened to her. Um, the, the Torah, purpo- the Bible purposely sort of hides exactly what happened there. Um, but the point I'm trying to bring down here, so we see here an example of someone trying to do something, take upon himself an oath, but when you're not careful of what you're doing, what you're saying, you can get into very, very bad trouble, right? So there's an important, it's important to be able to relieve that, to be able to nullify it. Here he wasn't able to do it, and, um, but as we mentioned before, when someone takes upon himself an oath to be a Nazir, to be a, a, a Nazarite, in that way he wants to uplift himself because he takes upon himself more prohibitions in order to make himself holier for a certain period of time. Most Nazarite, the, a simple Nazarite is for 30 days. He, has, he feels a, a great reason to do something um, in his life to up, uplift his spirituality. So with this little understanding, Ralph Cook, and we just explained now we have to go deeper, a deeper understanding of what, why this prayer is so important on the opening of Yom Kippur. And the answer is, is that, and I might have mentioned this in one of my classes, is that well, what, what is when God come to judge us? We are now in the period of judgment, right? On, on Rosh Hashanah, in the new year, we were judged. And on Yom Kippur, we're being sealed. And, and that has to do with our comparison between our potential, what we have inside in our potential energy that we have to do things in this world and to fulfill great things in this world compared to what we have achieved, what we have been able to achieve. And every year God looks at our, as the year goes by, He reviews our potential, right? Every individual person is judged, everyone does not not spared from judgment, and, and God looks at the person's potential and says, you know something, that you could have gone here this year. And He compares that potential to what He has done. And he weighs and judges that person. So it's so, so important, you know, that, that we are aware of every, every aware of our really self-awareness. We have to work on our self-awareness to realize, have, what have we done throughout the year? We reflect, we go back. And repentance on a deep level of repentance is us to begin to understand, you know, and to have remorse over things that we could have done or things that we did that were improper. And it, be, it allows us to begin to do a, a self analysis, a personal, um, uh, personal investigation of, it, of who we are and to begin to realize really who we are. And that we do through our work, our divine work, through, through repentance, through, through deep meditation of understanding who we are as individuals, what could we do, what we were going to take upon ourselves and make a plan for next year of how we're going to go about ourselves and, 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 and go forward. All this kind of work is divine, divine work, it's called it. Avodat Hashem. And unfortunately, when we are um, not, you know, not meeting our potential, that's when it causes all kinds of, of struggles and difficulties in our lives, and we don't meet our potential. We don't feel that, that, that satisfaction of, of really bringing to fruition of who we are. Now, the concept of, of, of midarim, we just spoke about it a moment ago, of, of oaths, is that a person could use this ability when he wants to feel like a powerful emotional burst of helping him meet that potential by taking upon himself an important, important thing he wants to take upon himself. And by doing that particular thing, for example, a person takes upon himself, he wants to now give charity on a regular basis, 10% of his income, he will now take upon himself to give that charity. A person wants to take upon himself to, to reach out and, and every day go to an old age home and, and help the elderly, all kinds of things a person takes upon himself and it becomes like an oath for him. Now, when he had that feeling of burst of, of, of energy that he had to do this, so he took, he made the oath, right? But sometimes a person takes upon himself things that he can't really knack and handle them. And then it comes to a point where he's not going to fulfill his oath and he's going to fall. And, and that can cause that. Rabbis talk about this in a very, very powerful way. God forbid a person doesn't fulfill his oath it can bring upon tragedy to their homes. It's a very, very serious business if you don't fulfill what you are saying. 
So because that the fact that repentance and our going forward and meeting our potential is all based around our, our, the ability that we have as human beings to take upon ourselves all kinds of things to do, therefore the opening prayer on the Yom Kippur service is all about that, that we are beginning now with saying in advance, Hashem, we are nullifying all our things that, again, that we wanted to do, right? we wanted to take upon ourselves, and over the year that we did take upon ourselves and we're not able to fulfill them so we're sort of getting a pass and we're able through this special prayer we are relieving ourselves not again in the, in the good sense is that realize that we're human beings and not everything we're able to to overcome not everything we're able to take upon ourselves and that we need again to begin a new year a new plan it's like someone having to pay a mortgage off and he, he has to redo it, you know. He has to re, um, um, what's called refinance his mortgage because it's not working in the payments the way he thought he could do. And this is something that, that takes place every year. So we're opening up our, um, our um, Yom Kippur prayer, <laughs> our service of the entire day when there are so many things to talk about, about the, the priest going in the Holy of Holies and the Ketoret and offering the incense and... And the and the and the the goat the scapegoat and all the different things that went on and the sprinkling of uh, of on the altars all these things that you could talk about, but we're beginning with realizing in the most simple way of who we are as human beings, and and where and where can we go from there? Where where can we go forward? How can we build our lives? How can we better ourselves? Let's start a new. Let's clean our ourselves from our, um, you know, from the things we took upon ourselves over the year, and we are nullifying this. And also from now until the new Yom Kippur, we're saying we are nullifying, we're not, we don't want to bind ourselves in things that we can't handle. But there is, we see from the Torah itself that the concept of oaths is very, very strong and it's there. It's there because it's an important thing, right? Um, Jacob was the first time in the Torah. The word oath is mentioned is with Jacob. Jacob takes upon, him, takes upon himself an oath, right? If God is going to watch over him when he goes out into exile, so the, the oath is there for us to be able to go forward and to fulfill it. But sometimes we need a pass. Sometimes we, we have to get readjust again. And that's the beauty again of this prayer, which became ingrained and very, very, it became, it marks the, the holiday of, of, of Yom Kippur. Everyone talks about, it's going to show us, we've got to go to the Kol Nidre. Let's go you start the first prayer we do on, the, on this special day. Um, but anyway, this is um, very important thoughts I had. I also heard a very interesting class by Rav um, um, Haggai London that spoke in, in this direction that I heard from him, but I added, again, other, other directions. But this concept is extremely, extremely important. And it was on my, on my mind that we had to talk about this because it's something that, you know, we do it every year. And people, even understanding the meaning behind the, uh, and what it's all about, it's important to learn and what we're reading and what we're saying, how we're nullifying our oaths. I'd like to... Um, bring down, you know, as we know, this, this, this day is so powerful with our, our repentance, and we have to um, ask Hashem for forgiveness. That's what this day is all about. I'd like just to read um, the words of Maimonides and a couple of his powerful um, laws of repentance, and it, it is what we're talking about. The Rambam in Laws of Repentance, he brings down in Chapter 7, Law Number 4, he says, Right, a person who's a bal a person who truly repents, um, he shouldn't think. Right, a person shouldn't think about someone like that. And uh, as well, obviously, a person should not think about himself or a person shouldn't think about others. That a person that came from a bad background, that he sinned, but now he repented. He should not think that he's far away from the level of the righteous because of the, his past sins that he did. The Ram says this is not true. But he's, low, he's beloved before God. God loves this person. As if he never sinned before in his life. Not only that, he has a great reward. Because he tasted the um, taste of sin. And he moved away from sin. And he captured 
his um, his evil urge. Chachamim, our rabbis say, Makom shebalei tshuva omdim, the place where, where those who repent stand, great, the great righteous cannot stand. What does that mean? The Rambam says, Malatan gedola malat elu. His level is higher than their level. Of those that never sinned before. Why? Because this person is able to capture his yetz, his, 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 his urges, he's able to overcome. These powerful words of, 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 of Maimonides, I think says it all, is that a person, through the, the self-awareness, is able to turn his life around. And this is the beauty of Judaism, is understanding that, that re, the power of, of tshuva was, was given. Before the world was created, it's one of those things that God created before the world. Right? There were different things that were created before the world, and one of them was tshuva. Because that is the most important thing of this world, is for us to realize where we're going. We are returning, we are returning to Hashem. And the ability to reverse our life situation, a person that makes, that does a sin, you can say to yourself, in this world, in the modern world, when someone did something, you can't bring it, you can't re- bring it back. You know, it's, the damage was done. How could you, how could you, you can try to rectify what you did, but certain things can never be rectified. A person, God forbid, did the sin in terrible ways and committed terrible crimes of, of murder and terrible things you can't even imagine. Um, obviously, you can't bring that life back that he took away or other, or other terrible things that that person did that can't be re- really rectified. But the Torah is revealing to us something very powerful, is that there is a way of going back in time. It's like a time machine. And you're able to literally rectify your inner being from the most darkest places that you've been and become a true repenter before God. That's, that's something that's so powerful. And every one of us, we can't skip over the process. We have to work hard and have that self-awareness and take upon ourselves, as we saw before, that feeling of an oath. Take that energy and, and use that energy to go forward, to guide you in this direction of, of of, of self-awareness and, and repentance. And this is really a power. That's the whole purpose of these oaths, to try to uplift us. But again, God is saying to us, and God's again telling us in the opening prayers, when we do this, we're praying to Hashem, you know, we know we have to do, and we know that you, you judge our potential every year compared to what we've done. But we need to pass now because sometimes we, we take upon ourselves a little too much. But it's very important to realize that the, the good side of, 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 of the oaths is there for us to really deeply get back into who we are. And that is really what repentance is all about, to return to ourselves. In Hebrew, the word ani, for me, means, comes, it's the same letters as ayin, comes from the meaning without. We go deep inside our soul, we go to the aim, or like the, the ein sof, we're connected to the ein sof, connected to ourselves, we're connected to, to Hashem, the creator of the universe, the highest worlds, And we're able to begin to return and connect ourselves to Hashem. This powerful day is, is, is on the doorstep. Let us utilize every minute of it. It, goes, it starts and ends so quickly, and we have to try to focus on those prayers and that moment and, and on who we are and how can we utilize every moment of this special day. And Rabbi Yudana see the great prince says, the, the day itself has the power of, of healing and repenting. Just the day, just the fact that the day comes in. But all the more so, of course, when we utilize every bit and, and have true remorse, of what, we've, of what we did in the past and try to rectify and think about how we're going to build our lives in the coming year. And of course, this has been a year that has been terrible. Corona, is, is, people have lost, so many people lost their lives. And we see so much tragedy all around us. It's been such a difficult year of this plague and, and, and we're dealing all the, all the time with the symptoms, the symptoms like, you know, instead of realizing we have to deal with the root of the problem. And that is really what Yom Kippur is all about getting back, getting to the root of the problem, to rectify our, our inner souls, our inner um, well, garments that are tainting. Our souls are pure, but we're rectifying our, obviously, our garments that have to be cleansed and rectified so we can reveal the beautiful pureness of our souls. And this is the great, what a great message, a very, very important message of the holiday of Yom Kippur, where we begin with Kol Nidre. I want to bless and wish all our wonderful um, listeners, our wonderful friends, and those who are following us, and friends of Itama, I want to wish you all a beautiful year. A gemar chatimat should be a beautiful ceiling, and we all should be blessed with a beautiful year ahead of us, with health 
and happiness and success in all our endeavors, God willing. Shalom, shalom. Chag Sameach. We will be in touch very soon again. Have a very meaningful fast, and we will see each other soon. Shalom, shalom.